Welcome everybody, I'm Sam Stanley, and thank you so, so much for coming today um, to this town hall meeting on diversity. Um, the third one I think that we've done, um, I had to miss the last one, so I'm glad I could be here. Um, and it uh, looks like a, a very good turnout, and uh, we'll be very interested in what you have to say, and I think that that's what I want to lead off on. There'll be an element of reporting uh, in this meeting, but very brief, and most of it is for discussion, and that's what we look forward to. So let me begin um, by um, introducing or asking the people who are here today uh, to introduce themselves. And so I'm going to start on my left. And if you just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Robbie Kincaid, uh, director of the Ready Project. Dr. Marissa Biziani, assistant vice president for student health counseling and outreach services. Good afternoon. I'm Lou Deonis. I'm the interim chief human resource officer at the hospital. Hi, my name is Braden Hosh. I am the Assistant Vice President for Institutional Research Planning and Effectiveness. Good afternoon, Marge Lee Leonard, Director of the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity, Title IX and ADA Coordinator. I, I may need your micro microphone. <laughs> that isn't my name though. Um, Ken Koshansky, I'm the Senior Vice President for Health Sciences here and Dean of our School of Medicine. Good afternoon, everyone. Rodney Morrison, Associate Provost for Enrollment and Retention Management. Hi, I'm Stella Circa. I'm professor in the Department of Pharmacology here in the School of Medicine. I'm also a Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and co-chair of the Faculty Working Group. Hi, I'm Judy Griman. I'm Chief Deputy to the President and also the Vice President for Government and Community Relations. So. So a lot of work has been going on um, over the past uh, year and a half or more um, to improve what Stony Brook is doing in the way of diversity. And as I said at the beginning, I'll spend a few minutes just talking about some of that progress and I'll ask Judy um, to comment as well since she's really been spearheading this um, for the university as a whole. Um, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves what we're trying to do and what we've been trying to accomplish. Um, we're interested in improving the diversity of the Stony Brook community through enhanced recruitment and retention. So that's at the student, faculty, staff level. All of those components are critical to us. Expand educational, research, healthcare, and other efforts to ensure that Stony Brook students have the ability to thrive as members of the campus community and as global citizens in a diverse society. We value diversity for a number of reasons on our campus, but one of them is we feel that it's a core component of our educational mission is to enhance diversity and allow our students to develop within a diverse uh, environment. Support the development of a campus climate that values diversity, equity, and inclusion in a way that promotes the ability of members of the community to thrive and achieve their individual goals. And that, again, speaks to what I said before. Um, there's extraordinary value associated with diversity uh, on our campus. It has to be a core value and a core commitment for us. And finally, and this is very important, is establish a culture of accountability uh, on our campus uh, and assessment around diversity and inclusion and those policies. And accountability is very important. That accountability includes me, that includes the people sitting at this table, but that includes all of us as well as being accountable for the kind of efforts we're putting in to ensure diversity on the campus. And that has to be foremost in what we're trying to do. And that's one of the reasons, as we talk about implementation, why it's so important that we have metrics associated with that as well. So we're looking at what we're doing, but we're also measuring what we're doing and looking at outcomes. Because developing a plan and even implementing that plan without ways to evaluate how it's performing uh, means it's destined to be less effective. So it's very important for us to have accountability in what we're doing. It's also important in terms of how we're looking at the plan. So for all of the senior vice presidents, all of the vice presidents at the university, Part of my evaluation now of my direct reports is the progress they're making on diversity within their units. I have numbers, and I've talked about this before, that tells me what the diverse, uh, how, uh, what's the diversity makeup, essentially, uh, of these units in terms of the employees, faculty, staff, and so on. So it gives me an opportunity, basically, to look and see how are we doing in this particular area, what progress are they making. And it's now part of their performance goals and evaluation goals to make improvements in these areas where necessary. So this is an important part of it. So I, I really like this idea that there's a culture of accountability uh, as we move this forward. So I have the next slide. So we came up with a plan. It was an extraordinarily inclusive effort. It involved many people, and I see people sitting in this room who I know have played an important role in moving this forward, and certainly a number of the people who were sitting up in front here had key roles in doing it. Um, and the plan, I think, is, is I thought was a very good plan. 
But the one thing we talked about from the beginning was this is not going to be a process about just a plan. Okay, it's not a process about just a plan. It's a process about actually implementing and doing. So this, as we said from the beginning, is not going to be a plan that sits on a shelf. It's not going to be a plan that somebody discovers three or four years later and says, oh, what a nice plan this was. I wonder whatever happened to it. Uh, in fact, it's something that's going to actually be done. And so that's what has been happening really over the past six months uh, as we've been implementing. So to do this, we had to create a structure. And so the structure is based upon a steering committee. The steering committee contains a number of leaders of the university, people who have interest in this area. And their job is to really break down obstacles, um, to chart the course, what are the things we ought to work on, and then help fund resources as well, find resources to support those. Because resources are coming from my office, but there's going to be resources required um, from, from Ken. There's going to be resources required from other units on the university if we're going to make this work. And those resources are not just money. Um, those resources are time and effort, right? Because this requires sweat equity. It's not just a question of putting dollars into things. It requires people effort and time. So it has to be something we valued. As I said, it has to be something people are accountable for, but it has to be something people are going to contribute to. So there's a leadership that comes from the uh, steering committee and a priority setting. But also, I like this idea is their job is to break the barriers, making sure that things are going on track, and also then play an important role in the assessment that ultimately comes through as well. We have an advisory council. So this is a way to become more inclusive. So we have students on the advisory council, faculty, staff on the advisory council. And their job, again, is to help evaluate what we're doing, give feedback on what's happening at any given time, and really report uh, to the steering committee and to other leaders. And then the real work, um, not the real work, I shouldn't say that, that's not right. But important work has been taking place through the working groups. So the on the ground kind of work has been taking place through the working groups. And these include, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through everybody's names, but there's a group on assessment and evaluation. There's a group on communications, external and internal community, uh, including our police department. One of the things we thought was important was to develop better relationships between groups on campus and the police. There's an intersection in so many different ways it can occur. We know that's been a flashpoint, of course, around the country, is how communities view and interact with the police force. So we wanna make sure we're doing that right at Stony Brook, and that's been a major part of the engagement plan. Facilities, understanding issues around them. Um, faculty, that's obviously critical. One of the things we've talked a lot about is our need to improve the diversity of our faculty. Uh, we lag uh, in that area. There's no question that we need to improve there. The same with staff, we need to do a better job in this. So getting people who are engaged in faculty and understand faculty hiring the processes around them, getting them engaged in this process has been critical. Graduate, postdoc, and professional students. Again, we're a research university. Graduate students are a critical part of our efforts. Our postdoctoral uh, fellows are important on this side of the street and the other side of the street as well. Um, and then our non-teaching staff and human resource services. Again, critically important, uh, absolutely vital to the functioning of the university. We want to extend the kind of diversity that we want to see and that we see to some degree in our student body. And we want to expand that to everybody who's in a position of responsibility uh, on the campus. And then of course our undergraduate students. We're moderately diverse or relatively diverse compared to many campuses uh, in, the, in the United States, but we need to be more diverse. We don't actually accurately reflect the community we live in or the community that surrounds us. We want to do a better job of reflecting New York State uh, and that community. Next slide. So if, Judy, if you could talk a little bit about kind of some of the nuts and bolts or some of the things I haven't brought up in this, that would be great. And I'll just stand to the side here. Thanks. So I just want to give you a little bit of the process that we used to come up with the 2017 work plan, and then President Stanley can hit some of the highlights of the 2017 work plan. Just to go back a little bit in time, last year at this time, we, were, we really spent all of last academic year um, talking across the institution, all sides of Nichols Road and, and beyond, uh, far beyond, um, talking about things that we needed to do on this campus to um, make it a more welcoming community across the board and um, had you know a number of conversations town halls etc things that went on last year and uh, released a plan around those four overarching goals in May and then from that point forward the working groups really began their work and they had the task of saying okay so what first because it's a it's a multifaceted plan um, and so their goal was to come up by around the end of December with a set of um, suggested much more in the weeds work plan for 2017 as well as budget priorities 
um, they did their work very well. They came up with about $65 million, I think, in, in, in requests, which, of course, we don't have $65 million. Um, but they, they really took the um, job seriously and tried to prioritize. Um, our job was then to spend this year, you know, January, February, March, working with every VP area to say, so what, what can you really do? Um, because even if you have the money, and I use the provost as an example, I think there are about 40 things for the provost office to do. It's not, not possible in, in 2017 to get those 40 things done. So what are the things that are most important and that they can actually accomplish or get started? And so that's what um, we released in March was the 2017 work plan. My um, caution and plea is that people are looking at the budget part, and President Stanley will hit some of the key things that we funded, but also some of the things that didn't require funding. So my plea is read the read both documents. Um, the work plan itself is extensive, and many of the things that are happening don't require new money, and so you miss them if you only read the budget piece. But that was the process to date, and I think that the work plans will, the working groups will come back in the fall to sort of see where we're at, give some suggestions for 2018, but the 2017 work plan is really, this is what's doable and real within 2017. Um, the other thing is that we had two um, sort of chunks of money to work with. There was a $750,000 commitment in this academic year, which has not yet been, most of which has not yet been spent, and a $750,000 commitment in the coming academic year, in spite of our tight budget, that commitment was was made and kept, and so we actually have a, a nice pot of money to work with over the course of the next um, year. And some of that has all been identified in the budget, and some of that has been held back as other projects come to light and as our CDO gets on board. So that's just a little bit of a quick quick explanation of sort of the process to date, and then I turn it back to you to hit Thank some Thank you. So what was identified by the working groups and uh, uh, approved essentially by the uh, steering committee? So I'm just going to go through some of these things and talk a little bit about it, but hopefully it'll give you a feel for the kind of uh, work product essentially that we're looking for in the plan. Um, this is all available on the website essentially, so if you go to the diversity website, all of this information, the original report, uh, the plan, what's been budgeted, what is also being done, as Judy talked about, that isn't actually, you know, doesn't require dollar investment, but as I said, does require people's work and effort to get done. What are all those components so that's there? Um, but just as an example, um, workshop for faculty, uh, re-American Disabilities Act progress, and on ADA technical mandates. This is actually a complex uh, issue, and we had great advice from our uh, uh, committee that advises us on issues related um, to disabled. Um, enhanced rec recruitment of minority students, including scholarships. So how do we enhance our recruitment of minority students? And Rodney may be able to answer questions a little bit about that today and some of the things we're doing uh, certainly at the undergraduate level and Ken and others perhaps can talk about what we're doing at medical school, professional, and graduate levels. Um, preferred names on ID cards and diplomas. That's an important issue around gender and people's identity. Um, so to have preferred names, and that's something we did in one of the first campuses in SUNY um, to implement that. Um, a preparing future faculty conference, so the idea of really trying to improve the pipeline, the idea of identifying graduate students, postdocs, who could be future faculty, helping to train them and helping get them prepared for the opportunity of being faculty going forward. Targeted support for faculty hiring. So one of the things we find sometimes is that um, we may not have the resources. We may have more than one qualified candidate, for example, for a position, but not have the resources to support them. Or there may be someone very good, but maybe just too expensive. So when we have opportunities to intervene and help with diversity hiring, we look for those kinds of opportunities uh, to move forward. Uh, a leadership fund um, to encourage attendance of leadership conferences, participation in national fellowship opportunities, again, how do we help people um, promote their careers? And particularly for candidates, uh, diverse candidates, diverse faculty members, diverse staff, how do we help them promote their career? And also to promote Stony Brook. It's actually good for us if we're exhibiting our diversity uh, around the country. That's a positive as far as I'm concerned. So how do we help facilitate that and what can we do to do that? Um, uh, mentoring workshop um, for women in science and engineering, ISTEM, uh, and these, other, these programs. 
Um, it's very important. One of the things we know is that in the past there's been higher attrition for women coming in to in areas in the sciences as well. And we know that with proper mentoring, particularly again talking about programs like our WISE program, uh, we're able to improve those numbers significantly. And other schools around the country, I was talking to the president of Georgia Tech, for example, and the kind of progress they've made. Other schools have really enhanced their efforts to retain individuals who go minorities, uh, uh, gender, to, to, to search for gender equity uh, in these fields, and they've had success through programs. We need to emulate some of those programs. We have some, a good base in our WISE program and others, but we need to look at ways to improve this. Um, we have been looking um, for a chief diversity officer. Um, we've had uh, outstanding candidates, and I think we're close to making an announcement uh, on that position. It's not finalized yet, but we're very excited about that. That's someone who's really going to help uh, coalesce I think all of these efforts on both sides of the street, what we're doing, it's a very important position in terms of what it's going to bring to the table. Um, I think the fact that we had this plan in place made this job much more attractive. The fact that the plan is in place, the fact that we're, the fact that we're moving efforts forward on the plan, the fact that there is money allocated for it has made this, I think, an attractive job for people. So I think we're going to be able to hire somebody very, very good. As I said before, we had excellent candidates for it. Um, we want to develop an online community forum um, for SBU employees, and I talked before about recruiting staff and faculty. Is that, is that it? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, more, okay. Um, added diversity, inclusion, and gender equity components to opening weekend and 102 curriculum. One of the things that we've really heard from a lot of people, and particularly from students, was that you know, this is such a core part of, of what they want to learn with their at Stony Brook. They want to get it right from the beginning. And we think it's important that people get this training right from the beginning. Why? A, because it helps acclimate you to what's going to be a diverse environment, we hope, at Stony Brook. Um, but, but second, I think because it shows how much we value it at the university. It shows it's a high priority for us. So as part of the other things you're getting in orientation, you begin to get orientation uh, around diversity as well. Um, we've had, I mentioned before about the work we want to do with the University Police Department. That's been a priority and that's going to be a priority in the continuing budget. Developing activities that bring students and police together in a different environment than they might normally meet or confront each other. Um, so to really work to diffuse, to establish relationships so people understand each other better, uh, I think that's an important program going forward. Um, athletics has been working for some time with the You Can Play program, which came out of the America East, which is a program uh, involved in particularly the LGBTQ community and making sure people understand that the, every, anybody can be an athlete, anybody can play, and gender, uh, these are not issues that interfere or should interfere with people's ability to play and get engaged in uh, NCAA collegiate athletics. A task force that's working on ways to better support our international students and help integrate them into campus life. This is important for the university. 17% of our students are international. They come from different cultural backgrounds. There's issues that they may face in terms of communicating problems they may be having on campus, ways in which they may feel intimidated, hierarchical structures in their cultures that may make them difficult to file complaints about people who may have authority over them. For all of these reasons, we need to do a better job of helping them and help uh, uh, get them into our uh, uh, inclusive uh, campus environment. Support for enhancing mentoring for underrepresented minority faculty and students at the School of Medicine. So Ken can talk more about these issues and what we're trying to do specifically um, for the school. Um, and again, trying to strengthen student employee recruitment efforts, and we've talked a little bit about that before. And finally, last, and there's other things besides this, this is not an inclusive list, but finally last and certainly not least uh, is the responding for equity and diversity inclusion ready program uh, that's led by uh, Dr. Kincaid. Um, that's been an incredibly valuable program. It's a commitment. Um, it's not a training program. Um, it is, right? I, did I say that right? I shouldn't even just mention the T word. Um, it's not a training program, but it is very much an immersive program that helps us recognize um, where are the hidden biases, where are the hidden prejudices we have that might make us less effective uh, at recruiting. Uh, that might make us less effective in our interactions with fellow employees, staff, students, and others. This is incredibly important. We've had a great demand for it, but I encourage people um, to reach back, and, and I'm sure uh, we'll have a chance to talk to Dr. Kincaid more about this, but I encourage people to, to reach back uh, and, and, and get your departments, get your groups, get your colleagues to participate in one of these things. It's a time commitment, um, but I think it's time really well spent. And again, my expectation is senior leadership of the university will have completed this. We do searches, you'll be doing searches. I think people who are engaged in searches should complete this kind of training to make them more effective in what they're doing. 
So why don't I stop here and uh, turn it over to Judy, and she's going to MC questions, because we talked about before, what we want to do is hear from you. What do you think of the progress we're making so far? What are the questions you have about implementation of the plan? I'm actually going to sit down, and we'll let Judy uh, uh, moderate this. So. So we got, we got a bunch of questions in um, via the website, so I'll do some of those and then we can take questions from the floor, but since people submitted them in advance, let's, let's get it, let at least touch a bunch of those. Um, so for Rodney, and then I think that Rodney, Jenny, Ken may want to answer on, on sort of on this side of campus, which is really all around student recruitment. So how is Stony Brook University working towards increasing the number of African American students on campus? Um, and since, question one, and since you're revamping your recruitment activities, will you make an effort to recruit in racially, ethnically, and disenfranchised communities on the island? And one thing I just want to add to it is one of the things that we did immediately was we released a chunk of money immediately um, to Rodney so that we would, they could be, the money could be used in this recruitment season to make some different, different, a take some different actions than we had in the past. So I'm going to turn it over to you. You guys hear me? So uh, this is my third year here at uh, Stony Brook, and for many, many years, there's been um, a number of recruitment activities in uh, many disadvantaged areas on uh, on Long Island, and so this is not something that's that's new in terms of uh, undergraduate uh, admissions, nor is it new to some of the departments uh, who. I've been doing some programming uh, in areas uh, like Wine Dance, uh, Central Islip, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so there's been um, a, a number of activities, um, and not just um, uh, you know understanding sort of the, the what the community needs are, uh, and so it's it's uh, not just in a situation where <laughs> we can go in and say, hey, come to Stony Brook. There has to be more of a of uh, in, in some of those areas, really developing a pipeline and really developing uh, relationships at an earlier age, um, one, to, to help the, the communities, uh, some communities understand uh, what is necessary to be successful at a college. Uh, and then, uh, and hopefully uh, some will, will um, come up, and, and we have seen some of those efforts pay off, and, 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 and we're starting to see some inroads uh, in terms of enrollment here at, at Stony Brook. But these are long-range, long-term uh, efforts that, that need to go on from, a, 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 what we say, a K through 20 model. Uh, and Chancellor Zimfer uh, has held a couple of meetings as well, and so we are working with uh, some, uh, some K through 20 CBOs as well. Uh, not just on Long Island, but in in uh, uh, on, uh, in uh, Harlem, on the Bronx, uh, and um, Long Island City, and so really, it's developing the pipeline, particularly for underrepresented uh, students. So, um, I'll just add too, because it's all in the the diversity plan. But but a number of those efforts, uh, and and I have to thank the. Uh, President Stanley and, 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 and Judy Griman as well, because some of the money that, that was allocated uh, to us went to um, not just in terms of things like busing that uh, will we'll bus, uh, we'll have a number of students coming on campus, because part of it is seeing it and believing that you can actually be at a place like, like Stony Brook, uh, but, but, uh, but also for programming uh, to, to really have our current students interact with, with some of the uh, applicants and, and admits, and I saw uh, one of the students in the back, Isaiah, can you wait hand? So Isaiah was one of the, the students we, we brought to, to Manhattan to talk to uh, our diversity admits. Uh, was that a week or so ago, Isaiah? I'm two weeks in my mind, I'm, you know, I'm a little. Uh, and Isaiah can tell you, he did a really nice job about just talking about what his experience is here as a student, because I think, I think most students, 16, 17 year olds, who are looking, trying to make that decision where to go, they know we're on the payroll, right? But when they hear it from someone who um, is experiencing from his perspective, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. So the ability to, to have programs uh, where we come to them, they don't always come here, but we come to them and that uh, students like Isaiah are able to say, you know, here's my experience. And Isaiah, I don't want to steal your thunder, but, but you know, he mentioned how it wasn't that easy academically. 
right? And how he overcame it and the things he did. And I thought a lot of, a lot of prospective students of color said, wow, that's, like, that's what I want to hear. Everywhere I go, I get the, oh, you'll love it. College is easy. No, we, we wanted to really bring the, what's the truth and, and, and transparency of what it takes to be successful at a top-notch institution like Stony Brook. So uh, those are the kind of programs that um, we were able to, to do a little bit more of. Um, and um, should I mention scholarship side or, or you tell me? So um, in terms of, of for our neediest students, and these are sort of full Pell, um, full tap students, there's still a gap in aid, okay? And this was, again, a, a gap meaning that even for our neediest students, they still have to come out of pocket, okay? This was prior to uh, a couple of weeks ago in the, uh, the Governor's Excelsior Plan. And so uh, for those students, uh, you know, they really have to make some, some uh, uh, you know, heart-to-heart -heart conversations with, with parents. And so uh, for us, uh, what we found now since the Excelsior announcement that there's a lot of confusion, uh, not just between parents, uh, and students, but also guidance counselors. So we're doing a lot of, of Q&A, and, and, and I know HESC is starting to do some, some Q&As across the state as well, but really understanding what it means uh, and, and to make it, uh, it, to make sure that students understand the commitment uh, and, and, afford it, and the affordability and what it means to be successful here. So, so that's a critical component. It's not just are we admitting students. Uh, and uh, I, I can say this, that Based on where we're at today, in terms of our undergraduate deposits, uh, we, are, we are up in underrepresented numbers. So we're up um, close to 5% right now in terms of African American. And um, we are probably going to come in flat with Hispanic. But we had a huge year last year for Hispanic. We had a record year. So we'll either be close to that or just underneath that and likely wind up with a, uh, a record year for, for African American students. Uh, so again, it's, it's about relationships, it's about communicating, uh, it's about getting our current students uh, uh, involved and, uh, and working with a number of, of, of faculty uh, and administrators. And I'll say this, and I forgot to say this at the last town hall, there, there have been a number of you that are here in the, in the audience and, and those on campus that do a lot with diversity. And, um, and I failed to recognize some of them uh, last time. I, I won't do it because I always I'm going to mess it up. I'm, I'll miss somebody. But I just want to thank you for your efforts and, and, continue, and hopefully you'll continue to do so. And, and if you have ideas or thoughts, please come, come uh, talk to me and, and, or email me. And against Rodney Morrison. Because uh, uh, this is an all hands on deck, it takes a village uh, approach. So let me just add, add one thing. And, and first, Isaiah, thank you for, for helping out. And this was initiative that really came from the students. The students really pushed us and said, we think we could make a contribution here in terms of recruitment. We'd like the opportunity to do more. Um, but the other thing is just to say, I mean, it's nice to talk about positive things once in a while, right? And we, we actually have a very good story to tell in terms of outcomes. So as some of you may know, there was recently data published by the National Clearinghouse that follows graduation rates um, uh, for uh, students across the country. And based on their data, there's still, and this is not good news, there's still across most of the country and most schools, there's a gap in graduation rates between underrepresented minorities and whites. That still exists and that gap is fairly significant. Um, that gap is essentially abolished at Stony Brook University. There is no gap between our underrepresented minorities, black or Hispanic, and our white students in terms of graduation rates. So that's something we're very proud of. It's not something we've really publicized that much. This data just came out, um, but it's very exciting for us to talk about. Um, doesn't mean we should rest on our laurels. Everybody's graduation rates actually should be a little better, I think, at Stony Brook, so we have work to be done. But I'm really pleased to say, and I'd say that's the effort that we're putting in right now, that you've been putting in right now to help uh, do this. And I look at programs like EOP and others that I think are making a big difference. So we gotta build on that, but we need to promote that work more because I think we can say uh, you know, to people in a very honest way that Stony Brook is a place where you do have a chance to succeed and we're gonna work very hard to, make you, to help you succeed because our expectation is you will succeed because the students who've come before you uh, generally do. So that's an important part of this, I think. Ken, did you wanna? Yeah. Sure. So, so, so thank you, Rodney, and, and thank you, Sam. I wanted to follow up on some of the um, initiatives, some of the themes that Rodney was speaking of, uh, outreach, for example. Uh, one of the most enjoyable things I get to do, um, and I was invited, uh, this was a couple of years ago this started, 
and I'm not quite sure how to address uh, this individual. It's either President or Reverend or Dr. Butts, uh, the President of uh, Old Westbury, or all three, or he'll go by Calvin also. Um, he invited me to come to Old Westbury, which is, of course, one of the most uh, diverse campuses in the SUNY system, if not the most diverse, um, to speak about what it's like, what hurdles, what kind of uh, challenges uh, do the students, uh, the undergraduate students, have to get into medical school. And uh, it was uh, very enlightening preparing for these talks, uh, delivering those talks, doing the question and answer period. And so outreach is very, very important and understanding what are the hurdles. Um, I learned very much from our students of color uh, in this process and am more convinced than ever that one of the biggest hurdles is overcoming the challenges of uh, working and doing well in undergraduate work, working and doing well on the medical college admission test. And so we in the medical school actually uh, look very carefully on the admissions committee at the challenges that the applicants have gone through and give a lot of credit to the challenges and overcoming the challenges uh, that a lot of our students who come from underrepresented groups uh, face. Um, another element of sort of the outreach is to help those students who didn't quite make it into medical school uh, do an advanced degree, get a master's degree in physiology or in pharmacology. Uh, we are helped by the uh, AMSNI, the Association of Medical Schools of New York. They have a program that funds, uh, uh, he that provides help for students who have graduated from undergraduate, who have a bachelor's degree, to get a master's degree. And we have one of the most successful programs here at Stony Brook in physiology and pharmacology. Uh, there's about a 50% yield of the students who come into those programs in getting into medical school, either here at Stony Brook or elsewhere. So that's another way to really reach out to the community and help them get into medical school. And I know that we are very successful in, in our School of Social Welfare, in our nursing school, our other schools as well. Um, another element, I think, is to sort of lead by example. Uh, we have done, uh, at the urging of a lot of our faculty and our staff, uh, to bring into the dean's office very prominent, very important people. And I see four of them right here uh, in the audience. Uh, Francis Brisbane and Nell Lewis and Jenny Williams and Cordia Beverly are here. Uh, very important parts of our leadership team here at Stony Brook. Another important thing is to have conversations. These are amongst the most difficult conversations we have in humanity. The whole question of race and how do we get to the level playing field? How do we give everyone a shot at success? And we've had a series of diversity dining events where I have learned a lot and all the participants, I think, have learned a lot. And one of the things that um, have come out of these events, these diversity dining events, I think as a more frank conversation about what are the hurdles and why it's important. Um, there are some who would say, well, all that's really important is you're a good doctor that, and, and nothing else really matters. Well, that's not quite true at all. And there is importance. Uh, you could say, well, a cancer biologist, who cares what color the skin is of a cancer biologist. But the questions a diverse group of cancer biologists are going to ask are somewhat different than what a person like myself might ask. We know there are all sorts of disparities in healthcare outcomes in medicine. Uh, and so people who are willing to take on the challenge of why is it that, that, uh, that black people die more frequently of colon cancer than Caucasians do, take on that question. And I know we have a very strong effort here at Stony Brook to address that very question. And then finally, there are gonna be some people who say, well, you know, we're gonna to have to you know, lower our standards to be diverse. That is utter nonsense. Uh, I'll point to one of uh, our chair of surgery, Mark Talamini is here. Um, Mark has uh, a division of cardiac surgery um, that is remarkable. I would have no problem whatsoever when 
I have my coronary artery disease or I need my valve fixed, to go to Joe Chickwee um, or Allison McClarty. These are leading cardiac surgeons, and we are very proud that we have a very di diverse group of faculty in the division of cardiothoracic surgery. So I am not willing to accept in any way, shape, or form that there aren't outstanding faculty members, outstanding staff members, outstanding student applicants for Stony Brook Medicine. So having these conversations is important. Great, thanks. Um, Marjorie, um, have there been any issues on campus with diversity recently? Have any students or professors discriminated against any member of our campus in any way that suggests we need to change our plan from whatever we were doing a year or two ago? So over the last semester, we've had some anonymous uh, posters and flyers that targeted anti-Semitic, anti-Islam, and transgender pop members of our community. Uh, those have been reported and investigated by our university police. They have been reported to my office. Uh, members from the Dean of Students have reached out to those targeted population to provide support. We've had heard of some microaggressions in the classroom, and we've been working with those departments, and we always encourage our faculty and staff to take the ready seminar to make sure that they're understanding um, unconscious biasness and the things they do and say and the impact that it might have. The intent might be benign, but the impact can be very severe and great. As a university and as an institution that has over 40,000 individuals when we look at our students, our faculty and staff. We're a small city, and just like any small city, people are seeing what's happening on a national level, um, and they have concerns, rightfully so. The method for reporting has not changed. If there's ever any safety concerns, we always encourage people, their first phone call is our university police. They are accredited university police officers. They're 24-7, 365. We also encourage people to report things to our office Office. And we're hoping that with this diversity plan, it's going to serve as a tool to um, help people be aware of embracing who they are, but also learning about different cultures and background. The wonderful thing about Stony Brook is we have people from all walks of life, and if we're willing to venture out of our parameters, there's a lot to learn, and we can educate ourselves. And so the reporting mechanism has not changed. I think as we educate people to become more responsible and be more aware of their rights and responsibility. We're empowering people to step up and say, this is not okay, I need to say something and I need to do something. Um, so for Marissa, um, if you would, there have been a question that came in and then a couple of questions have come directly to me from our um, students with disabilities really asking about what, what really are the resources and what are the things that we're doing as a campus to work with students with disabilities. So if you can give sure. us, and we've actually had a change in how we service our students and employees this year, as well as a renewed focus, so. Sure, sure, so um, as Assistant Vice President of Student Health and Counseling, one of the areas that's under my purview is disability support services. And it is a very, very unique uh, area because it's an area that the team as well as staff, students do vocalize sometimes, they do feel underrepresented. And when we implemented the diversity plan, there was a place that we had a lot of work to do. So uh, the Office of Inclusion, Diversity and Equity and DSS are actually reviewing um, ways to actually enhance the services that are being provided to students, staff and faculty. And as uh, Judith mentioned, with a new structure and new leadership, we've actually strengthened this area this year, and I do expect to see a much more targeted approach to helping our students and employees. Um, additionally, the President's ADA Technology Committee um, are doing a lot of work in 2017 to look at technology websites in terms of accessibility, looking at it from that perspective, ease of use. And we've also engaged a student focus group, and that group is actually already up and running. Uh, they meet and they talk about what are their experiences utilizing the technology on campus. We're also gonna be holding professional development workshops for faculty and or a symposium so we can create some conversation and dialogue um, around supporting the students and staff, faculty with disabilities. Um, I'll just do a couple more from here and then take questions from the floor. So, Robbie. 
if I can find the question. Um, how do you plan to, how do you plan to train staff on hidden biases and does it um, include education on cultural competency and humility and LGBTQ training? Uh, yes, so um, some of you may be familiar with the Ready Project. I mean, we talk about it uh, a lot, and I see some faces of some people who have attended. That makes me feel very, very good. I'd like to see more of you there at the Ready Seminar. Um, but basically, uh, Ready is an implicit awareness uh, bias seminar, wherein folks spend about six hours, because it takes about six hours to really get down to the nuts and bolts when it comes to talking about things as sensitive as diversity. And when we say diversity, we're speaking of it in its widest sense. Uh, that includes the LGBTQ plus community, uh, race and ethnicity, veteran status, socioeconomic status, and so on and so forth. So it's an experiential uh, um, venture wherein people are engaged in activity, group activity, uh, group discussion, and also use of case study to try to um, come to terms with some of our own implicit biases and some of the uh, microaggressions that occur on a daily basis uh, for, for ourselves as well as for our students. Um, we uh, currently are taking, um, collecting data related to the um, impact that uh, Ready is having on some of the participants. Um, we've received nothing but positive reviews so far. There's been nothing negative, I'm very pleased to say. And again, I would encourage all of you or any of you who are interested to just visit the diversity website and you can register for a Ready seminar. There are several uh, dates out until July and there'll be uh, additional dates posted throughout the summer. And you may do some of them on this? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. We may be doing some here on this side of the campus, without a doubt. Great, so last one of the ones that came in before, um, President Stanley. So one of the questions that's come in here and it's coming in a couple different, at the other town halls as well, has been how we um, really support a diversity of ideological and political thought on campus as well as other forms of diversity. And I'm gonna throw that one to you. Okay. Um, so I, I think as was uh, as largely stated, um, there's more than 40,000 uh, individuals uh, on the Stony Brook campus, employees, students, and staff. So within a population of 40,000 people, you're going to have a remarkable variety of ideological positions, of political affiliations, religion, uh, many things that might be seen as differences between people. But again, I think what we're looking for is a community that respects the differences, that embraces the differences between us, um, but doesn't seek to silence people, um, doesn't seek to stop people from expressing uh, the things they believe in, um, but does uh, do, try to do it uh, in an era of respect. Uh, and so I think that you know, we uh, care very much about you know, trying to create, as I said, an environment that where people feel comfortable uh, expressing who they are uh, and what they believe in. And so I think that's what we're going to continue to try and do. But there are, you know, the free speech, uh, freedom of religion, these are fundamental tenets of our country. They're fundamental tenets of the university. They're fun and they will continue to be respected. Great. So are there questions? I, you can either come up here or say the question and I'll just repeat it for the TV. Anybody? Thanks, Judy. Um, I have an observation and a, and a concern. So the observation is, uh, I don't imagine there are too many college presidents who would talk against diversity. So, uh, but there's a, there's a difference between talking the talk and walking the walk, as they say. And I just want to congratulate President Stanley and his team for walking the walk at Stony Brook, because this, uh, this plan gets below the surface uh, of just advocating for a diverse campus, uh, but it really gets into the weeds, and as the president says, uh, this is not a report to go on a shelf somewhere, this is an action plan to make sure that Stony Brook is really becoming, in depth, a real, a more diverse community, and I wanna congratulate him and, and his team on this. That brings me to a concern. So the concern is that, um, our current uh, underrepresented minority faculty are burnt out. Uh, they, you know, I love Francis Brisbane, you know, Dave Ferguson and George Ferron a lot, uh, but they are on every single committee in, in addition to doing their academic work uh, to represent uh, diverse, diversity on search committees and other committees. So in the interim, until we're able to hire more 
uh, faculty and professional staff, what do we do? How do we get to the point where we can, uh, without burning out our, our current faculty, how do we get to the point of representing these views on these committees? So. That's a great question, Ed, and uh, I think you, you definitely hit a point that is very important. And I think the effort that is being done is exactly to address, to address some of that, and that is by making everybody aware of uh, and sensitive to diversity. So you don't need to be African American to be a supporter of diversity and to be able to argue for diverse causes causes on campus. And um, between the Ready Seminar and all the efforts that are happening, all the uh, uh, attention that were, uh, that uh, is shown to, to diversity, I think this is getting accomplished, that people are much more aware and much more engaged and much more sensitive. I want to do just a quick shout out to Rosalia from the Center for Inclusive Ed uh, Education that is here because uh, the center is, is kind of a, a, a prototype of the community building that is happening at Stony Brook, and based on what they are doing, I think all of us are actually becoming much more engaged and much more aware of what's happening around us. So I, I just add, um, just a, 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 I, I think I'm still mic'd. Um, you can hear me in the back, is that correct? Yes. So. It, it's, it's a great question. So first of all, thank you for your, for your kind words, but it, it's a great question. And, and I think Stella you know, made a very good point. And, and what I'd add is that we're very fortunate that we have some senior members of the university who are able to do it. My concern, as you're pointing out, is about the more junior faculty. So I think a key thing is, you know, so for those of you who are department chairs, who are professors, who are responsible for mentoring some of our younger faculty to help them, uh, deal with this, to help them have the ability to say no, um, or to make sure at minimum that this service is recognized as a service to the university. So if you are being called upon in many cases um, to be a spokesperson, to represent an individual group, are you getting credit for that as we do the process towards tenure and is the recognition of this special service being done? So I think that is something that we need to talk about and think about. But again, I think in mentoring, to be able to tell people that sometimes you have to say no, that you, you know, if you're on a path towards tenure, it may be important for you to say, I can't do this much service and reach the academic goals I need to do. So that's a very difficult thing, but that's on us, I think, to mentoring. I think just as you said, if we can start getting past that critical mass so, so we don't need to constantly rely on a smaller cadre, that will be very helpful to us. But again, that's why I'm grateful to the more senior people um, who do have tenure, who are protected from that point of view, who are able to maybe devote more to that kind of service. What is the budget that you're allocating for leadership development? Um, I, I don't know the exact figure, but we'll find out for you. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, Judy's going to look it up. Yeah. One of the things that we've initiated in the school is to send some of our students to leadership conferences and just this year to the Hispanic Medical Student Association. And so we're, we're, emphasizing that our leaders, uh, the individuals of color, get that experience, get that voice, get the face of Stony Brook at those organizations. Is it only for uh, minority organizations, or is it like, if you want to go to like a Harvard I mean, the goal was that it's for general leadership and fellowship opportunities. There are a number of them, ACE, Harvard, all around the country. And I think that what we were finding was when we would encourage deans to send people, they would say, well, who's paying for it? Um, and so what we tried to do is to put a, a small pot, I, it's, it's on the website, I have in my head 50,000, but I just don't remember, um, that there would be at least some central pot of money that could be used for it with deans and departments supplementing. And so at least that there'd be something to sweeten that pot and to help people to go. They're, they're telling me that people are. <laughs> um, so my, my question is two parts. One, patient-focused. Is there a plan to 
um, start engaging some of the community, the diverse community in regards to having, I don't know if you look at patient population according to race, but I'm a Central High subgraduate. I've always wanted to work at Stony Brook and I've been um, honorable enough to say that I represent Stony Brook, but sometimes even looking at our patient population, I'm unsure if that engagement's happening from the physician and nursing level. So that's one question. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take that one on. on. One of the uh, things that I'm very proud of in Stony Brook Medicine is our leadership of this program called DISRIP, uh, Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment, great acronym, uh, program. And what it's designed to do is to improve healthcare access, improve the quality of healthcare that's delivered, and because it's a federally supported program, reduce the cost of healthcare. Now, some might question, how can you do that? How can you increase access, increase quality, and reduce cost? Well, that's just a fallacy. You can do all three of those things. And this is targeted specifically at the Medicaid population. It's, it's targeted in large measure to the central part of Long Island. There are 420,000 people in Suffolk County who live at two times the poverty level or below. And that's what this program that we are leading has to do with. And so we're investing resources in outreach. We're investing resources in what is a way to identify patients who need particular focus, attention, outreach, make sure that they are getting their medications in a timely fashion, et cetera. And what are the patients who we don't have to invest as much time and effort in? So the DISRA program, um, because it's aimed at uh, impoverished populations on Long Island, uh, does have, unfortunately for society, uh, overrepresentation of people of color in that population of people. And we've now reached out to about 500 primary care providers in this program. We've reached out to a lot of community health care workers. I think we've trained an additional 300 uh, community health care workers to help us get out. And this is not just people with MD after their name. It's the nursing school, it's the social welfare school, it's the health technology school. We are all participating in this effort to create better healthcare access and better healthcare quality for all of the residents of Suffolk County. Hello. Um, so according to the enrollment statistics from fall 2011 to I believe fall 2015. Um, international student enrollment has increased by 93.8%, which I think is great that Stony Brook University is being recognized um, internationally rather than just in the United States alone. But um, the enrollment rates for black and Latino students barely increased 12.7% um, and 31.8% respectively. So what are the tactics that we're using to increase our international enrollment that we can also use to increase our national enrollment of underrepresented students? Um, and if we are using the same tax tactics, then how come they're not working? How much time do you have, Isaiah? <laughs> All the time uh, in the world. So in terms of it, two things. So one, with international students, um, prior to um, this political cycle, there was a, a growing number of international students coming to the United States, right? And there were, um, and more institutions are, were, are recruiting international students, but there were more to go around. This is not the case with um, underrepresented uh, students uh, of color. Um, it, it, there's a, there's a finite pool, and so uh, essentially you either have to do this. Uh, you either have to grow the pool, right? We have to, in other words, we have to get more students college ready uh, or and um, still compete for those students who are ready. Uh, but that number uh, is, um, you know, depending on, on who you talk to, uh, either declining or, or staying flat. And so... Uh, how do we compete? So uh, some schools have unlimited scholarships to, to be able to do that and looking at some students as sort of like highly recruited athletes, right? Uh, I think we have to, to make the case for fit and fit being uh, working with students at an earlier age 
uh, so that we're building that relationship with them, whether it's fifth grade, sixth grade, I mean, you can pick the, but before high school, because by the time a student gets to high school, they've already made their decisions in terms of, um, you know, I mean, I've, I have a, a fifth grader, a sixth grader, and an 11th grader. Uh, my, my, fifth, my sixth grader, she's known where she's wanted to go to college for years. So um, we have to do a better job at reaching back earlier, and we have to do a better job at helping students who want the opportunity to go to school uh, you know, to help them out in terms of getting them college ready. So I'm involved in a number of different organizations trying to do that. Um, so, uh, and I know some of you here are doing a lot of work as well. So I think what we need to do, Isaiah, is, is get a bunch of us in the room uh, to, to continue to see how we can work together toward that, that same goal. So I think, you know, so scholarship, yes, would that help? But I think we have to really start to grow the, the, the pool of students who, um, who, in terms of college. Last question, David. Yeah, more Thank you, Stella, for um, mentioning the Center for Inclusive Education. So in recruiting diverse graduate students and postdocs, I know one of the challenges that I've been facing and the team has been facing is uh, not only building a more inclusive environment here at Stony Brook, which we're all very actively working toward, and definitely attend Ready Seminar if you haven't already, um, and possibly, possibly become a facilitator, but uh, it's the surrounding community that is starting to, uh, for me at least, become a bit of a challenge. You know, cost of living, um, just a more inclusive environment. Is there any talk about how we might be able to branch out try to build more of a community outside of Stony Brook? I mean, I can give one small answer, um, which is part of um, uh, the issues around our surrounding community have come up in a number of ways. And I think so, some of it is helping people to understand that there's a, there's a broader community on Long Island that supports Stony Brook that's beyond the two miles around Stony Brook. Um, and Another part of it is that within our own community is really building that community. And so that's one of the things we're doing is this Brookology, which is a website that really will have things for people who live and work here to, you know, hey, there's a, let's do a softball league. Hey, there, here are area churches. Here are area what have you. I think there'll be some um, information about different neighborhoods and all that. So really trying to help people to sort of look a little bit beyond what's right around the campus um, you know we do extensive on the government and community relations side we do extensive work with our immediate neighbors around particularly around student housing issues which have a race component um, and extensive work and so um, some of that is around our students being in houses in the surrounding communities that are have been illegally um, configured and so there are lots of issues around that there are a lot of enforcement issues we work closely with our students to help them understand what are sort of legal rentals and things like that that helps to calm down some of the animosity that sometimes happens um, you know we still have neighbors who um, wish it was 60 years ago and that, you know, Stony Brook either didn't exist or was a teeny tiny place. We're not that. We haven't been there for a long time. We're an amazing resource for Long Island and for this community. Um, and so it's really continuing to build those relationships. I don't know if anybody. The only thing I'll add is, is that you're right in terms of some of the challenges that Long Island as a region faces um, and cost of living is, is high among them. Um, it's one of our challenges, so if you look at a state allocation that we get from SUNY, it's modified slightly um, for the cost of Long Island, but doesn't come close to really matching what we pay for things like utilities, for capital constructions and buildings. So it, it is a tough place to be, but there's also a lot of positives about the area as well. Um, I serve on the Regional Economic Development Council for the region, so I have a role in taking a look at plans that are designed to make Long Island more livable. So there's things like the third track uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, transportation. 
Um, we've worked with the county executive a lot to try and do things for safety reasons for our community uh, and students around as well. So I think we try to be engaged in every facet that we can uh, to improve these kinds of things. But, but I agree with you. I think we have work to do. And I think it's, it's disappointing sometimes, as Judy implied, that um, I think people don't recognize that you know, there's a $5 billion, $6 billion, I don't know what the number is now. We're going to be doing a new study, economic impact from Stony Brook on this region. It's extraordinary. Um, we are the largest single site employer on Long Island. So in terms of the economy of this area, we're really uh, critically important. And of course, our students are part of the raison d'etre, you know, of why we're here. Um, but people, you know, tend to be narrowly focused on their own interests. Um, it's not just Long Island. That's the case for most major universities around the country. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to give up. And again, one of the things I've talked a lot with Judy about is you know, making sure that you know everything we can do to make sure that our students are welcome in this community and recognized for the strengths because they're part of the university and that's part of what we bring to the community overall. But it, it is a challenge. Do you have any parting words? Uh, other than thank you all for coming, thank you for your engagement in this process. Um, you know, and you know it's an evolving process, so input. It's still welcome. That's why we have the plan. That's why we're continuing to communicate. That's why we're doing these town hall meetings. Um, we don't think we have this solved. Um, we don't think in any way, shape, or form. And feedback on some of the programs, what we're doing, or these things that you think are effective, as well as helping us develop metrics that matter uh, as we evaluate this. We've been working hard to do that, but I'm, we're really open to other ways of doing it. I spend a lot of time you know, talking to my uh, colleagues uh, in the AAU about what their campuses are doing, so I'm trying to understand best practices. But I hope you'll do the same. And if there's programs you hear about in other places that appear to be effective, we want to hear about as well. So this, this dialogue needs to continue. And because uh, I say, we've, we've made, I think we've made some progress. Um, we have a long way to go. And uh, I, but I think, you know, together, uh, we can really make a difference. So thank you so much again for coming. And thank you for your engagement in this. Thank you.